Hey, so you've, uh, you've made it to the Gospel of John study, part number four. So this is uh, the first of the studies that we're not going to be doing on Sunday morning. So you're a part of that now. And uh, if you want to go back and catch up, you can. You can look back online and see the other Gospel of John studies. There are the first three, and we're still in chapter one. So here's my promise. The next one is going to be the beginning of chapter two, but uh, we will be done with this sort of introductory setup time, and then we can move through the uh, the events, the narrative, and then next the next study, chapter two begins the uh, the wedding at Cana, so turning the water to wine, starting to get into sort of uh, the public ministry of Jesus. So today uh, we're going to pick up in John chapter one, verse thirty-five. Okay, so if you've got your Bible, you want to read along with me. It's going to be up here for you. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God. So here we see John the Baptist again making his claim, talking about, Behold, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He is the Lamb of God. Uh, this is a reference that is a combo platter, right? This is a combination of the Lamb of Atonement, upon whom the sins of Israel was to be laid as a part of the Day of Atonement. Uh, also, you know, this is also meant to sort of symbolize the Lamb of Passover, whose blood was to be the, the reason why the wrath of God passes over those uh, that have sinned or that have failed in that way. And so... Here you have this combination view of the Lamb of God being the Lamb of Passover, the Lamb of the Day of Atonement. And so when John's audience heard him say for the second time, Behold, this man, right, looking right at Jesus, behold, he is the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. This is a significant statement. And so here in verse 35, we see that he was there with two disciples. Uh, one of those will be named as Andrew. Uh, the other is unnamed, and so there's been some discussion around well, who is the unnamed disciple here. It could be John, the gospel writer, um, that would help us to understand how he knew the events that were taking place in order to record this in the gospels. But also, it would make a lot more sense, I think, if we saw this as Philip. Philip is named later on in this encounter, and you know, there's an immediate take up of faith for Philip. So having this pre-exposure would make sense, but it's probably it's probably not that strange to imagine that there were multiple disciples of both Jesus and John surrounding in this one spot when this declaration is made. But in, he sees, after these two see uh, this, this declaration by John the Baptist, they, they become followers. They, they want to follow after Jesus. We see this in verse 37. So let's look, John 1, 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So this is in an encounter, an exchange that would have been common for those that were familiar with rabbinical teaching and discipleship. Um, it would not have been a normal situation for a rabbi to come up and to find a student and say, you need to come be my student, because that shows a lack of respect. It would always be the student who would seek out the rabbi and say, listen, you are a wise man, a man of God. I want you to be my teacher, my rabbi. And so that's usually the process that you would go through. And so these two, they, they hear John the Baptist say, behold the Lamb of God, looking at Jesus. They see this for the second time. And so then they pursue Jesus and they come to him and they say, let's hang out, right? It's really, that's all it is. Like, show us where you're staying. This is not some sort of special thing like his room was magic or anything. This is just, hey, you look like the guy that we need to be following. John the Baptist says you're the kind of guy we should be following. And he just said you're the Lamb of God, so can we spend some time with you? Okay, so this is interesting because in the Gospel of John, the true mark of discipleship is not necessarily that they were people that were following after Jesus, but it's because the crowds pressed in around Jesus and followed Jesus from place to place and forced him into times of solitude. That's not discipleship. In the Gospel of John, discipleship is really best defined as abiding, remaining, staying, 
So these two disciples of John, now the one of the disciples of Jesus, come to Jesus and not just follow after him, but they say, we want to spend time with you. And so this idea of, of sharing space and time and getting to know Jesus, this is that idea of abiding and remaining. Uh, if you look in John chapter 15, verse 5, it says this, Jesus said, I am the true vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This idea of abiding and remaining, uh, meneo, this idea that you are, you are resting in Christ, that you are in Christ, that you are joining with Christ, this is what true discipleship looks like in the Gospel of John. So this is what these two were about, and then they began to follow after, and they remained with Jesus. So we pick up the, uh, the rest of what happens in verse 40. So John 1.40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said, and who had followed Jesus. See, I told you a second ago, it was Andrew and this unnamed disciple that we don't quite know yet. All right, let's look at verse 41. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, or Kephas, which, when translated, is Peter. So here we have the, one of the ways we, we think about the calling or the naming of, of Simon as Simon Peter or Petros or Peter. Um, you know, we find this in the Synoptic Gospels, especially Matthew chapter 16. It's around this discussion when Jesus asks his, his disciples, hey, who does the world say I am? Uh, who, who are the people saying I am, and who do you say I am? And that's when Simon, Andrew's brother, at that point, speaks up, right? And this is much later in the life and the ministry of Jesus with his disciples. But here in John's Gospel, this is brought up at the very beginning. It's sort of a collapsing of events. Now, we don't know, is this repeated later in the life of Jesus? Possibly, right? It could have been the first stage, first encounter with, with Jesus and Simon. And then later on, we see that after they return to the Galilee and spend some time in the Galilee, uh, Simon and his brother go back into the fishing world again, right? They go back to work. They're not necessarily full-time disciples of Jesus at this point. And that's when Jesus comes along, gets in the boat, they push off, they have the miraculous catch of fish, and Jesus and Simon have a moment where Simon says, oh my gosh, you are the Son of God. And um, that's interesting, because that, that is a development that often we think that that happened instantly. As soon as Jesus came up, he had this amazing experience. But here we're seeing in the Gospel of John that Simon and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist, and that they were early engaging with uh, with Jesus in this really powerful and special way, but that it would eventually shift and change as they went back to their hometowns, as they went back to the normalcy of life, and Jesus recalls them or reminds them of their calling as disciples later on. The occasion is not really the point, though, here in John's Gospel, okay, when it happened and how it happened. Uh, the biggest real influence, the biggest thing we need to pay attention to here is the act of invitation. Okay, so this is what it's all about. Andrew, not Simon, not his brother Simon, not Peter. Peter is not the hero in this encounter. Andrew is, right? Andrew has this moment of faith in Jesus. He trusts what he hears from John the Baptist. He goes and he learns more about Jesus of Nazareth. He spends time with Jesus. He becomes a full-fledged remaining disciple of Jesus. And then he goes out and invites his brother, who is nearby, to come and meet Jesus. Andrew is the hero in the situation. He's the one who's done the right thing here. Uh, he has called on those around him to come and meet the person that he believes to be the Messiah, the Savior. And so next we hear in verse 43, John 1.43 says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
Look again, this is an absolutely amazing encounter, especially if Philip and Jesus had no interaction before, right? If Philip wasn't there when John said, Behold the Lamb of God twice, um, yeah, then this is amazing that Jesus would just walk up to somebody and say, Follow me, and they'd say, Okay. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense, and it actually fits in the way that discipleship really works, if if this was the unnamed disciple that was hanging out with Andrew, I mean, it makes sense. They're all together in the same place. They're all from the Galilee. In fact, if you think about it, Jesus and John the Baptist, okay, they were both born uh, to connected families, related families that all lived around the Galilee. Uh, then you have Simon and Andrew, the fishermen there. They have a, a home port there off the Galilee. Then you have Philip and Nathaniel, all of these four disciples plus Jesus and John are all from the same area, all from the same small lake in the middle of Israel. And it was a small community that would have, you know, probably would have known each other. Uh, and so there is this sense of, is Jesus calling him to be a disciple or is Jesus saying, hey, we're all going back to the Galilee. Do you want to follow us? Do you want to come with us? Uh, judging on what Philip says and judging on how he responds, this is taken as a call to discipleship, a call to faith, because Philip does a, a great job here. He takes up the call about he, what he believes about Jesus. He acts on that, right? And he goes and he finds his friend Nathaniel, who is also from the Galilee, but who hasn't been with him. He's been off doing something else. And he goes and speaks to Nathaniel about Jesus. And what does Philip talk to Nathaniel about? He says, hey, we found the Messiah. We found the one that Moses talked about. Okay, We talked about this last week out of Deuteronomy. Uh, when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were talking to John the Baptist, they said, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Okay, The prophet is a reference to Deuteronomy 18, where Moses is talking about the one day, God will send a prophet that's greater than Moses who will come and speak the very words of God and everyone will be held to account as to how they listen to or reject those words. Okay, uh, If there weren't this situation, uh, this would be hard to understand. Well, is Jesus this prophet? Was Elijah that prophet? Who knows? And then here you have the situation where Philip comes to Nathaniel and makes it clear for the reader, we found him. Jesus is the one that Moses promised. He's the one that Moses talked about, and, and he's here amongst us. And specifically, I love this. I love the fact that, that he names Jesus in the most specific way possible. All right in your English translation, it's Jesus, son of Joseph. Uh, he's from Nazareth. Okay, but I love how if you, if you took this in Aramaic, or took it as a the, sort of a Hebrewish sort of a reading on it, it would be Yeshua. His name would be Yeshua. That's Jesus. It's like Joshua uh, in Hebrew. So Yeshua ben Yosef. Okay, Yosef for Joseph, and ben is the designation of son of. So Yeshua ben Yosef, and he, and he would have then been named from Nazareth. So a specific town, a specific family, a specific son in that place. Uh, we're really getting right on the money as to who is this Jesus and who is it that they are looking to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right, next we hear in verse 46 what Nathaniel says in response. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Come and see, said Philip. So what is Nathaniel's problem? It's one of those things where without any sort of background, any sort of context, we just assume that, that Nathaniel has a problem with Nazareth. He, maybe he went there and got robbed one time. Maybe he had a bad meal there. I don't know. You know, you just don't know. But if you read the Gospels, right, you don't have to go back and live in the first century. All you have to do is read the Bible. It will explain itself. If you read the Gospels, you find multiple times where people are derisive about Jesus, saying he can't be the Messiah because we know he's from Nazareth. Not saying that being from Nazareth is a disqualifier, but they're saying that they know where he's from. And they assume that you wouldn't know where the Messiah would, was from, that he would just appear out of thin air, sort of like a, a ghost on the scene. And, you know, that's not the reality. The reality, as we just talked about, is that Jesus is the son of Joseph. He is from Nazareth. He is known by those people. 
And so here Nathaniel is saying, what? No, that's not possible. The Messiah is not some guy from the Galilee. I mean, I'm from the Galilee. You're from the Galilee. Philip, he can't be like us. Like, that's just weird. It's silly and stupid. Nathaniel is expressing something that the average Jewish person who was encountering the gospel would have thought about Jesus from Nazareth. He was saying out loud what many others would only think later on. He's saying basically, how is it that, this, that God in flesh, who's come to be the righteous king over Israel and to rule the world in righteousness, how is it that he could be somebody so common, from such a common place? It just doesn't fit. They expected something bigger and, and grander and more majestic. But that's, that's the beauty of God in flesh. The Emmanuel has come to be God with us, not to be God above us, not to be God out of reach of us, but to be with us, to live with us, and to be like us in the sense that we encounter the world in the same way. Next, let's look at what happens in verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. So here Jesus is demonstrating that he is God in flesh, that he, is, he has this uh, knowledge that he couldn't have known because he wasn't there. And Nathanael picks up on that, right? He, he's pretty amazed by that. And it's interesting because Jesus could have, he could have chastised Nathaniel for making fun of his hometown, right? He could have been like, hey, who do you think you are? You know, your hometown's no better than mine. No, instead, Jesus just, he actually praised him as being someone who is forthright, right? In whom is no guile. He's not a deceiver. He's not someone who's going to say one thing just to make you think that you like him. Instead, he's telling the truth. He, when he hears that Jesus is from Nazareth, he says the first thing that he thinks. It's not always a good idea, but he does it anyway. And he says, ah, it can't be true. And Jesus praises him for it and says, you know what, that's, that's great. You're, you're the kind of person that says what you really believe. And so Nathaniel hears that. Let's hear how he responds in verse 49. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. That is a big response for what really is a small miracle, right? The miracle of knowledge, of knowing something that, you know, that was over the hill or around the corner. That, you know, that, that's something that would make you step back and say, wow, that's, wow, that, how did he know that? I don't know, he, maybe he's a prophet. Maybe, I don't know, that's, that's pretty crazy. How did he know that? But instead, Nathaniel goes and he says what later Simon will say, right? Simon, who is now Peter, he's already been told you are... You are the rock. Uh, but in, in that situation, Simon didn't have the chance to confess his faith. And instead, Nathaniel does. Nathaniel says what Simon would say later. You are the son of God, the Messiah, the king of Israel. You are, you are the one we've been waiting for. So Nathaniel has his faith confirmed by this simple expression of divine power from Jesus. But let's listen to what Jesus says next. If you look in verse 50. Jesus said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus here is doing the very thing that I was just thinking, right? He's saying to Nathaniel, oh, okay, you know, you, you believe because I gave you this one tiny little morsel of my divine power. And good, you know, that's great. I'm glad that you believe. But here's the deal. If you walk with me, you're going to see more than you could ever have imagined. It's going to come at a high price. It's going to cost you everything. But you will see, and then he goes into referencing Jacob's ladder. What is Jacob's ladder? It comes out of Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. And in Jacob's ladder, this is a vision that was given to Jacob. Jacob is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. Okay, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Jacob is traveling across this promised land, and he goes to sleep one night near a place that would eventually become Bethel. And while he's asleep, he has this vision of a stairway that goes from earth up to heaven. 
And on this stairway are the angels of God, and they're seen uh, descending and ascending, right? Going up and down, up and down, up and down. And he wakes up, and he has this amazing epiphany that this is the land that God has truly given his grandfather and his father, and now him, and then his descendants, and that it is in this place, right? This is the place of promise that God has, has put him on purpose, and that this idea of seeing the angels of God coming and going in from heaven onto this land sort of confirms for him that this is truly the promise of God. That's an interesting thing for Jesus to have talked about, because Nathaniel... Nathaniel is the kind of person, based on his judgment, based on his statement about Nazareth, he's the kind of Jewish person who, who believes something that is going to have to be corrected, who believes that place, right, where you are from, the people that you are connected to, who you are a descendant of, puts you in a different standing with God. See, he would have been the kind of person that would have assumed well, I am a descendant of Abraham, therefore I have a right standing with the Heavenly Father because of my lineage, not because of my faith, not because of anything that I have done, but because of God's promise to Abraham. And while that's something that maybe you and I don't really struggle with so much anymore, but this is something that Nathaniel did. And so Jesus uses this Jacob's Ladder reference, I think, for a really powerful reason, because he's demonstrating to Nathaniel and to all others, and John is recording this and passing it around so that people will see that the place of blessing, the way that God will bless the earth, the way that God will send his grace and his mercy out into the people of the earth is no longer through the land, it's no longer through the people of Israel, it is now through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and none come to the Father but by him. There is no other name for salvation. There is no other name under which we are blessed by God. So Jesus is the ladder, right? He is the ladder upon which the angels of God are coming and going on the earth, the presence of God, the work of God, the blessing of God. Jesus is the conduit. You can't access the Father but through Jesus. That's the powerful point in this. Okay, so let's recap some of the things that I think are really essential in this teaching, okay? Things that we have talked about so far is really the inviting culture, right? Those who believed in Jesus, um, you know, even from John the Baptist pointing to Jesus, saying, oh, behold, the Lamb of God, the early disciples seeing Jesus, getting to know Jesus, and then inviting and pulling their friends in and saying, do you know this man? You need to know Jesus. He is the Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the Savior. And they invited others in. That's a powerful lesson for us. That's something that we need to learn from and to be engaged in ourselves. Who are we inviting to Jesus? Who are we inviting to church? Who are we inviting to our small groups? Who are we inviting to be a part of our sports teams to get to know us and so that we can draw them to a place of getting to know Jesus? And the second thing here is with what Jesus said about this idea that the blessing that people are looking for from God is not going to come to you because of your ancestry. It's not going to come to you because of where you live or the time that you live or anything that's related to your external qualities. The blessing of God comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Next week, we're going to get into the beginning of Jesus' public ministry at the wedding at Cana. I look forward to that. I'll see you then. Thanks.